10-year-old self. Then about seven years' time, the thing that has been bothering her, that that's what she's going to be talking about in front of an audience, and not just once. I think I expect a reaction from her probably looking up at me with her stomach squeezed, her barely able to think in the pain, and telling me, what are you talking about? There's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine, don't you see? My stomach just hurts. Well, there's more to that than just a stomach pain. What she has been feeling has been just a little dot in such a great picture in mental health. I have generalized anxiety and panic disorder. It is simply anxiety. I had to diagnose with anxiety by psychologist when I was about nine or 10 years old. And it was basically a long run of thing that I had. We'll, we'll come to my journey from the very beginning with my anxiety. But what anxiety actually is, I'm going to describe to you my life with it. A first part of it is overthinking. I cannot sometimes go on with a normal conversation without me thinking in my mind, am I saying it right? Am I not saying too much? Am I not saying too little? Am I not too quiet? Am I not too loud? And I sometimes, many friends and my family notices, <coughs> apologize too much. My most used word is probably sorry or excuse me. And it sometimes can be for, for literally nothing. Overthinking is honestly awful. Especially when people assure you that there's nothing you need to overthink about. That you're fine. That the situation is okay. And sometimes they even tell you that if there was a problem, they would tell me. But sometimes they keep quiet about it, sometimes they actually do tell me, which is great. But the overthinking is always there. Even on good days, I overthink, but I don't remember it. I have not really attended parties, as I always thought that I was going to just stand there, maybe awkwardly dancing. I've attended maybe one party, like a big one, that was at the end of our GCSE exams. And I remember the fun. Though I probably did have some overthinking moments once or twice, I don't remember them because the fun actually overtook that day. It also gave me some health issues. As I mentioned in the, my introduction, the stomach ache. For example, there's, I mentioned it, stomach ulcers. What I don't have is high blood pressure, but many people with anxiety do have that as their heart rate constantly increases. And honestly, this stomach ache that I've been describing you, it's been the worst thing of my life. Physically in pain, I have never felt worse. Between years 2011 and 2013, I think it happened to me four times, and these stomach aches lasted three weeks to a month. And I wouldn't say that it lasted like, okay, one day it hurts, then the other one, no. No, it didn't work that way. It hurt, it, it would always hurt in a row, until the end of the month or, so, or the time that it lasted. Insecurities, physical and mental. I struggle with insecurities on my outer body. There's days when I can look into the mirror and say, oh, okay, she looks okay, we're fine, we'll go on with the day. But there's days when I look into the mirror and think, disgusting. That that what I see in the mirror is just not okay. I sometimes see an overweight girl that's never going to find the love of her life because she's ugly. Yes, that's sometimes what I see in the mirror. But sometimes, of course, I see somebody who can go into town without thinking, oh, is my hair not too curly? Naturally, I have curly hair, even though for today I decided to straighten it. Or if my, for example, if I wear makeup, if it's not smudged or something, then I don't really pay much attention to it. And of course, that links also with the overthinking that I think about my appearance about my demeanor, about the way I speak, about the way I maybe do gestures. That's how I sometimes see myself. And I need to think about it sometimes. I'm not going to lie to you. Even now in my head, I'm thinking, am I saying it correctly? Or if I, for example, lose a word, my mind goes, oh damn. So that's how it goes in my mind. And the worst part probably are the panic attacks. When I had anxiety as a young preteen or a young teenager, to me it was so confusingly horrifying. My first panic attacks were like a trip to the unknown and I thought I was dying. Panic attacks, I decided to describe them in two ways, the physical picture and the mental picture. 
the physical one, is how I feel when it happens. It usually happens as my eye vision gets absolutely destroyed. I don't see as much color. I see just blur. It's like I was underwater, but the water was cloudy. Like extreme cloudy water. I can hear my own heartbeat in my ears like you hear in the scary movies when there's like a suspense scene and you hear the heartbeats. That's how it sounds in my ear during a panic attack. What also happens is that my throat feels squeezed as if air was unable to relieve and I could not breathe anymore. If somebody decided to strangle me strong or if my air pipe just didn't work, got stuck and I was going to and I was going to asphyxiate on the spot. That's how it feels. My stomach tightens probably to a size of a fist, if not even a little egg. That's how small my stomach feels. And I feel like my muscles and my entire body just doesn't function. Like if it was, as if I was a puppet. The mental picture, I decided to give it two interpretations. The first one is the alleyway. Usually when a panic attack happens, I picture it sometimes as an alleyway, as I'm being chased down by some monster in a dark alley and I reach that end. I press myself against the wall, maybe even slide down and sit, and I just helplessly watch as this monster approaches about to hurt me. And what sometimes even happens is that the hand even reaches out, but it doesn't touch me. But the thing is that it drags on forever and ever, and it doesn't stop, and you feel hopeless. The second mental picture is what I call the rubbles. It's as if I was being bombarded with a pile of big rocks. I was down there, and I saw that there was light, <coughs> that there is an exit, like a little one, but I was afraid to move, because if I would move, I would move a rock and it will get me even deeper. That's how panic attacks feel in my mind. I'll describe to you probably my worst panic attack that have ever happened. And that actually happened quite recently, last May specifically. I just got off training and I decided that after training, since it was break, I'll go to the shopping mall. It was on the way by the bus. So I, and I had enough time, nobody was home, nobody was waiting for me. And it was still quite early, it was like lunchtime. So I could go. But I remember that something struck my attention on the bus station as I was waiting for it. It was a woman beaten up. I think she may have been a prostitute. And I remember focusing on this woman until the bus came. I had my ticket and everything. And when I stepped onto the bus, I still paid attention to her. And I did not even pay attention to the fact that I had to put my ticket into that little machine that does I forgot. And guess what? The guy that was taking the tickets and doing the checks came onto the same bus. And of course, I was his target. I show him the unstamped ticket and instantaneously I know that there's trouble. 50 euro fine. I paid it and I remember being quite calm and collective about it while it was happening. <coughs> so after that happens, I call my dad to tell him what happened. And I remember that as I was calling him, it was already kicking in. I knew what was happening. I knew it was a panic attack that was happening. So I knew that I had to hang up on that phone immediately before he notices that. So we quickly ended the conversation. I hang up and I already know that I'm going to turn blind. And I remember physically doing this to the chair in front of me. Nobody was sitting there, but I hurled. The shopping mall that I was going to was the final stop, so everybody was getting off. And what happened was, in my mind, it noticed that I had to get off. But I don't remember standing up from the seat and going. It felt like I was thrown by this powerful force out of the door. And I remember hitting a wall, but not feeling any pain on my shoulder because my body was too busy processing this panic. And I was hurtled down crying, unable to breathe, and thankfully, this, mi this man approached me, asking me if I was all right, and I remember repeating, yes, I'll be fine, and I remember saying in Slovak the word zahmat, which means panic attack or seizure. 
The man misunderstood the word and he thought I meant zakranka, which means ambulance. And when he was saying ambulance, I said, no, don't. And so he said, are you going to be okay? And I said, yes. Even though at the time I thought I was going to die, but I already knew the drill. So what could go wrong? And then I went on. Now we're going to go with my journey. This is me six, at the age of six, a bratty little girl, skiing, making friends at school, trying to make it in life, and her being fairly happy. That went on for about four or five years. This is me when I was nine. This is a picture from vacation that was roughly in June 2010. Me and my brother sitting at the bow of the boat, enjoying the summer. What I didn't know that a few months later, everything was going to deteriorate. A few months after that, I suffered my very first experienced loss in my family. And I had probably the worst state of paranoia every time I heard the phone ring as I thought that every time it would ring, someone would die. That was my, always my thought, that someone was going to die. But nobody did. It was just that one situation, but it felt forever and ever, and I felt like every time I saw an unknown number on the screen, I was, something was wrong. But that lasted for about two or three years. Me as a 10-year-old was probably the hardest time, as my anxiety was taking a toll, and I was really confused. I had already a therapist, so I could talk my way out of it, but I had no idea what was happening. This picture specifically, it's from the 2011 to 2012 New Year's Day. And guess what? My anxiety caused me to believe the 2012 apocalypse was going to happen. So, when that picture was taken, just before that, what had to happen, of course, came midnight, and it was everybody was counting down. I remember thinking, oh God, no. Please stop the countdown. And I went on. I remember everybody else celebrating while me just stiffly standing there thinking, oh my god, we're going to die in the next year. But we didn't. <coughs> this is from 2013, and it was the last time that I had the issues with my stomach. I noticed in this picture, which was taken on the Vietnamese airport, was how skinny my arms were. I do not remember being that skinny, but that picture absolutely horrified me. I remember not eating for three weeks, and on our connected flight to Paris, I actually heard a story that I hurtled down in the middle of the floor because I couldn't handle it. This was a few weeks later, still in Vietnam. I already gained a little bit of healthy weight, but I was still skinny. It was the last time that the stomach thing had ever happened to me. But honestly, what had happened then was me coping differently with my anxiety, and that was overeating. I could eat, so I ate a lot. And a year later, when this was on Christmas, when I started to already gain weight, I still looked fairly healthy, but not skinny anymore. And nine months later, I ended up looking like this. Rather chubby, and I did not, I absolutely hate this picture, that's why I put it up there, just to show how awful I must have felt back then me overeating constantly, and at the time, my, it was probably the toughest school year for me as I felt like my anxiety was going to drive me nuts. Panic attacks were frequent, I felt lost, and I remember having a specific fear of the, of the day Thursday. Thursdays were my death to me. This was 2015, which was the year of the blue hat. Yes, my hat is not just a bad fashion statement. <coughs> It was actually the year when I bought this hat, which was my biggest comforter. For the sake of this picture, they told me to take it off. But I, but in generally, I wore it even inside, as it always comforted me and made me feel fine. And the entire year of 2015 was rather confusing, as the beginning felt rather hectic, but then kind of calming down. The, yes, the rest of the year, was rather calming, and now we're going to jump into December 2016. Yes, December 2016. And then IGCSE, IGCSE rolled in. Everything was going hectically. It was going crazy. I had to study a lot. 
and I couldn't really think anything outside the box, but I remember the summer of 2017 being a summer where my thoughts and my anxiety went into a frenzy. I remember being paranoid about death, which is, by the way, my biggest fear, <coughs> thinking about it that I was going to die, and that if I would die, what was going to be next? Basically, the summer was insanity. But then, I realized, maybe later in the year, you know what? We can keep going on, on like this. To be honest with you, I have not felt this confident about myself for the past seven years. And that was because, today, I realized that I can cope healthily. Talking about the issue was one of the most liberating things ever. I would write my pain into prose and poetry when I was 10 to 13, and even today I do that. I would often address this issue somehow and also do self-analyses on myself when I would sometimes see which parts of the month are worse than the others in the year or what. So I'm no longer surprised if at some point during the year I would get more anxious than the others. And I noticed that my bad months are from November to February, then up to, up to June it's more relaxed, and then it's slightly more frenzy, but until November it's rather survivable. These self-analyses help me find out a bit more about myself and something that is really important to me. I discovered theater, and theater was a way to express my feelings, feel confident as I could live in the, the the gut of the character, which were mostly comedies, and it was always a ton of fun. And just a few days ago, I actually came home from a drama festival, which was a life-changing experience in my confidence, and I'm glad that I did the speech after it. But something that's really important to me, like I said at the beginning, what I would tell to my 10-year-old self seven years later, and I think this is, applies to everybody with anxiety, even though it's very individual, what I would tell her today. You have anxiety, and that's okay. But you cannot let it be a part of your life. Yes, even today, now that I'm speaking to you as a 17-year-old, you'll have the days when you'll feel like your anxiety is taking over your life on 100% and that you're not even yourself anymore. It's just temporary. Though anxiety is a part of you, it's not you. You will find healthy ways to cope. You're going to talk about it, address it. You will be better. You're going to rise above it. And even though there's going to be days when you're going to be absolutely on the low, you'll get back up again. For seven years, you've been struggling, but you keep fighting. It's a fight that keeps on going and it will probably last for another seven years or maybe even longer. But now, as I'm speaking to you as a 17-year-old me, you'll be ready. You'll have armor. You will be prepared for this war. This war is not won or lost yet, but you are winning because you know your weapons. You know how to fight. You know their weak spots. You know their strong spots. You can get them. Anxiety is not and never will be you. It's never going to be your whole life, just a fraction of it, an experience, a bad roommate. But it will never, and I mean never, be who you are. Thank you.